Hello and welcome to Library Adventures Live. Today there's me, Olivia, and Ambreen. And today, our, our special guest today it really fits in. What she's going to be talking about fits in with this really hot weather because one of the themes in her book is climate change. So I hope you're all having some nice sunny weather where you are. Before we meet Claire, um, I was just wondering if anybody saw last week's session. So last week we had Eva Josekovic. Now, Eva's written four books, and it was really interesting to hear her talk about her writing and inspirations. Her work covers many topics. For example, her book, The Cooking Club Detectives, covers so many issues such as food poverty, online bullying, friendship, family, and self-discovery. One topic Eva was really enthused about was food, a subject we all have an opinion on. She set a challenge for people at home to draw or write about their favourite meal. And you can get involved in this challenge whenever you like. You can watch her session again on Catch Up. And if you'd like to share your, uh, your writing or your pictures with us, you're welcome to send to our email, lal at kirklees.gov.uk. Or you can tag us on social media and you can use the hashtag LAL, just L-A-L. Now, if you'd like to contact today's guest, or make any comments about the session or type questions in, just type in the in the comments boxes in whichever format you're watching. So today we have with us Claire Wesley, who's written her debut children's novel, The Lightning Catcher, which I have here with me today. It's an amazing book. Um, Claire works in the field of biomedical and environmental research. I know how awesome is, does that sound? So without further ado, let's welcome Claire today. Hi Claire. Hi Olivia. Hi Anna. Morning. Thanks for having me on. So exciting. You're welcome. Thanks. Have you got this nice sunshine? Yes, it's really, really hot. It's beautiful. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Now, Claire, um, am I right in thinking? Oh, actually, Claire, I'm gonna ask you, talking about Eva last week, she was talking about food. There was there was lots of fun talking about food. I'm going to ask you: Do you like to cook? Um, I do like to cook, but I've just come out to bring up a family, so it's still more of a chore, if I'm honest. Less <laughs> in food. So, <laughs> yes, I do like to cook, but not every day, every single day, 365 days. <laughs> <laughs> but if you just had to do one thing, what would be your favourite meal? Uh, to make or to cook? To make. To make. What would be your favourite meal to make? To make. Okay. I think spaghetti bolognese I like making because it's always, it's quite easy and straightforward, but it's the smells are always gorgeous and it's quite fun to make too. Yeah. I, I don't want to tempt fate, but I know from my cooking, it's quite hard to go wrong as well. It yeah. generally tastes good. <laughs> That's definitely the thing. Yeah. <laughs> What about your favourite food to eat? If no, if someone else is cooking, you can go to a restaurant. Indian, I think, actually. Yeah, I think it's got to be Indian every time. I can't resist. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Good choices. Right. Before we we're going to have loads of questions today. So if anybody's watching and they've got any questions, it'd be really good if you can send them in. Um, and we've got some questions for you as well, Claire. But before we go too far, should we get you to do a bit of a reading so that people who aren't familiar with the book can find out a little bit more about it? Okay, yeah. So right. I'm going to do a reading from The Lightning Catcher. And it's my book about Alfie, who's there with his bike. His bike's very important to him and to the story. Um, I'll just introduce it a little bit first. So it's an adventure story featuring Alfie, who's been transplanted from the city to a small village in the countryside because of problems that his sister's been having. So he hasn't particularly wanted to go, but the whole family has gone. He's left the city behind, he's left all his friends behind. And this village seems to have its own weather, but nobody knows why. Uh, things like frozen puddles here and there in the middle of summer when there's been no rain. Things like a wind caught in a bucket, rain that's just over just the one house, weird little things and bigger things and things that perhaps to start with only a child would notice. So 
So when Alfie starts investigating this because he's curious and he starts to fancy himself as a bit of a detective, he quickly finds that in this village there are no-go areas. And, but he needs to investigate one of those because that's where all the best clues seem to be. The weather seems to emanate from this place and also the place belongs to a, a rather frightening man who lives in a lonely house surrounded by junk, scrap metal, old farm machinery that's been abandoned and just left to rot into the ground really, uh, as if it's actually growing up from the ground. And what everybody says about this man is that he comes out at night like a bat, he never sleeps normal hours, he keeps strange creatures all around the place, creatures that he brings in from abroad, so the things that nobody is really used to seeing and sometimes they get out and they cause chaos, but none of that stops Alfie. In fact, it probably encourages him even more. He's brave and he thinks he's being a little bit secretive, but what he doesn't yet realise is that in a village, whatever you do there tends to get seen. And worse than that even, he has a new best friend in the village that he's met at school and he tries to rope this friend, Sam, into some of these investigations. And now Sam refuses to do a lot of them because he's more sensible and um, but the two of them still do end up in some quite funny situations and quite frightening situations. And the words and phrases that Alfie uses to persuade Sam are actually quite persuasive and I think they would have even persuaded me. So he'll see the wind all by itself in his dad's bucket. By the time he gets to somebody else to tell them it's gone, but with Sam, he'll say things like, it was bubbling the water into these demented spirals and there's no wind anywhere else in the village. You've got to come, Sam, quick. You've got to come and look. And he'll say things like that he's convinced that something is sucking up all the summer air, as it is today, and spitting out chunks of winter. So as, as he investigates and he trespasses, trespasses in this place where nobody else goes he ends up Sam doesn't go with him to start with um, so he ends up going there by himself which is a little bit frightening and ex accidentally he ends up setting something free he finds something and he releases it accidentally again um, and in doing that he unleashes something on himself and on the whole village and after that the weird little weather glitches turn into very big weather glitches, big problems. And then that's how the book unfolds. So I'll start reading from the place where Alfie starts to get really persuasive with Sam and he starts to entice him back to the creepy no-go area to find out more about the creature that he's set free. So this is just after that place. The wind started up in the trees. A minute ago, they were waving gently like friends saying hello. Now they circled round and round, faster and faster. Look at that, I said to Sam, and it isn't even windy anywhere else. Sam didn't say anything. Right, I said, I'm showing you that box. Sam shook his head slowly, no, I'm not getting dragged into this trespassing craziness. He made a big show of looking at the waving trees through his binoculars. I said, you're too careful. He said, you're too sloppy. I don't get you, Sam, I said. You're the science ninja. There's all this sciencey stuff going on up there. Inventions and whizzing creatures. And what do you do? You disappear. Of course I disappeared, he said because I'm not stupid. You might not care if people think you're trash, but why would I want a loser's reputation? You don't seem bothered about that, but it's a real thing. Just you wait until it actually happens. Hey, Sam, I said. Now, um, just like in the book where there's weather glitches, Claire lives in some sort of magical bubble. Where Claire lives, there's internet glitches. 
<laughs> um, so it does fit seamlessly into our, into a, her novel. Um, so she will reappear in a few seconds because she's done this a few times. At least she's frozen in quite a good position there. Um, Ambry, what's the craziest weather you've ever seen? Have you ever encountered like giant hailstones or anything? Uh, no, but I think like you know when you get downpour, um, that's like <laughs> soaks you. I think that's the worst with thunder and lightning. That's the worst I've experienced. Like you know when you get in warm countries, proper monsoon. Yeah, it just comes out of nowhere. Yeah. What about you? Um, probably similar. I know my friends had the big hail. They went on holiday and uh, borrowed a friend's car and it got trashed by giant hailstones landing on the bonnet like golf stoke, like golf balls. Um, but I think for me, it's probably, or do you know what? Maybe black ice. When you get the ice that you can't actually see because it's almost yeah. invisible. And it's so slippery. Yeah, that's I used quite to love watching them. I don't know if you know where it is, but when I was young, I still love watching World's Weirdest Weather. Oh, yeah. I still love watching that. Well, we've got um, we've got various weather books in the library and things, so we're open up a lot more now, aren't we, Ambry? And we're, yeah. the, 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 the hours are changing a bit, but you can come into our library and we've got various books on weather and we've got some of those weird weather books. And you can also, if you go to our website, kirkleyslibraries.co.uk, there's links to our online catalogue there and we've got some books about weird weather and things there. Oh, right. you can download uh, Libby onto your phone. That's true, and then you can read them anywhere. Yeah. Cool. It looks like Claire might be back. Are you Are you all right there, Claire? Give us a nod. Oh, yeah, she's good. Let's bring Claire. Claire, we've just been discussing our weird weather. <laughs> all right, okay. Have you had some weird weather? Just it, just uh, been talking about black ice and monsoon rain. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, wow. That sounds like a bit like the lightning catcher. Okay, yeah. So I'll carry on just from Yeah, I'm we'll put you back on. A bit. So, um, Alfie's saying to Sam, you do know that we're completely alone here, don't you? It is all okay. There's no need to liquidise yourself completely. Although I did feel a bit sorry for him. His mum's much stricter than mine. His mouth twitched a bit, almost a smile. We'll be really, really careful. You escaped last time like a total pro. Huh, he said. It was almost a disaster. He's got an old Bentley, so it made hardly any noise. I didn't hear it until nearly too late. I nodded. I don't know cars like Sam does. Hide the bikes in the hedge this time, I said. We'll be experts. We'll be gladiators. We'll be so slick. I scraped the tarmac with my trainer, holding my breath, pretending I wasn't really all squirmed up with hope. Sam sighed. Okay, in. Quick look, then out again, he said jabbing his thumb towards the garden and back to the road, right? We found a gap, shoved our bikes away, then darted into the garden. Sam's eyes were as wide as fried eggs, but we were in. I couldn't believe it. He was actually doing it, and it felt fantastic. We made for the trees. At the edge of Mr. Clem's broken path, the wind found us and blasted into our faces. A pile of tiny, delicate bones lay deep in the grass, all white and clean. Sam blinked at them, bending closer. Those weren't there before, I told him, feeling excited in a shivery way. Watch out for nettles. You can see where you went last time, he said. You've squashed these weeds. He was right. A trail of squashed undergrowth led from the path to the biggest tree. I'd murdered my cover. I started kicking up the nettles. Push them back to normal. Too late, he's probably seen it by now, come on. A carpet of moss covered the main path and above it, the wires hung, slack and strange. When we found the box, Sam's eyes were everywhere at once. On the wires, over his shoulder, through the trees, back to the box. Did you actually get an actual electric shock? I nodded. My feet buzzed. Even my teeth fizzed. I pointed to my forehead still tingling from where the creature brushed past. This was only partly true. The feeling disappeared when I wasn't concentrating on it. The wind above us sounded wispy now, like breath, as if it was caught on something. I pulled the hinge open carefully, ready to spring away if anything moved. Look at these wires and this shiny sheeting. Some electrical gubbins, isn't it, I said. And there was a little puddle of water here before, 
The cold spot is just here, I showed him. This has to be connected to the weather stub, isn't it? Sam crouched. Weird, he said. It might be an experiment. He poked a finger into the spaghetti wires that spilt down the outside, lifting carefully. Hey, I said, don't electrofry yourself to death. He ignored me and let the wires down gently. Pop the wire, he said, and look at these. He pointed at some tinier wires in one corner. Thin as hairs. I whistled, hadn't even noticed them. So something to do with the electrical conductivity doodles, he said. You got a little shock, he said that was crackling. So that must have been static. He tapped the blue grass. Yep, this is a solar panel. He must be running something off the sunlight. He squinted up into the tree and a gust of wind blew his hair upside down. Look, it's hidden in all these trees, but there's a bare place where the sun gets through quite well. I grinned. Knew your savvy would come in handy, he said. Sam blushed. Yeah, well, my auntie's got some on her roof. Exactly the same blue. Sam stood up and so did I. We looked down at the box. A bat could move quickly. No, I said. It was too fast. Some kind of insect? I shook my head. It was more like a piece of wind. He laughed. Wind doesn't come in pieces. It's just moving air. Well, this isn't just a cage, I said. It looks too clever and complicated for that. Sam nodded. Yeah, I must be feeding electricity into this for a reason. Maybe it's a life support system, I said. Sam widened his eyes at me. Cool, he said, nodding slowly. Of course. For an electrical creature, I said. I got two electric shocks. So that makes sense. It's an experiment that went wrong. Sam's eyes were wild. An electrical creature. I said he must have bred it, you know, like people say he does. He grinned. That's just ill. There are electric eels, aren't there? I said. Yeah, so maybe he got one and experimented on it, I said. That old man said he mangles things. Maybe it's a mangled electric eel. On dry land, Sam said. Yeah. Alfie, not one of your better ideas. There's no creature that's made of only electricity. He frowned at me sceptically. Are you really sure you saw this thing? I remembered something else. After it escaped, the box clicked and ticked like gas fires when you switch them off, like metal contracting. So something hot had been in there. His eyes brightened. He opened his mouth to say more, but at that exact moment the wind stopped. It didn't die away. It stopped in mid-blow, like a gasp. That's exactly what happened last time, I whispered. He grabbed my arm. Quiet. We listened. Crows circled the rooftop, then flew off silently. It was so still, we could hear falling cypress needles click and flutter through the branches. No hair, Sam breathed into my ear. I could tell his brain was whirling now or he'd have been too scared to make a noise. That cat that you saw, that cat that kept climbing on the box, he said, and now it's got no hair. What if it was a normal cat and not a bald breed? What if all the electricity made the cat bald? I touched my hair, feeling suddenly horrible. Can electricity do that, he said. It might, he said. And I'll leave that part there for now. And yeah, so that's that's just a little flavour of some of the things that happen, especially when you start trying to persuade somebody to do something with you. And uh, yeah, you've got a responsibility there because if it all goes horribly wrong, then it's your fault. In the <laughs> <Alfie's> fault. <laughs> that's fantastic. Do you know what, Claire? You, you've... Um... You've spoilt those funny hairless cats for me now. I used to quite like them, but now I'm suspicious of them. I'm just going to wonder if they've had some magic yeah. electrification process. <laughs> yeah, I love those cats. I was going to say, even though um, I've already read the book, I totally lost myself into that then. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, it had some great phrases. I love the um, sucking up the summer and spitting out bits of winter. <laughs> Yeah, I have to admit that's one of my favourite phrases. <laughs> where do you, where does that come from, Claire? Did that did that just come out your head, or did you have to write it and rewrite it? 
that, that, that phrase. phrase i can't remember quite where that came from but it just seemed to it, that that's one of the few ones that just seemed to arrive without too much trouble without too much searching it was just bare so i think it just grew out of the circumstances really um but the original uh, the original sort of inspiration for the idea for the book it came in bits and bits and bits so to start with we've got some trees in our own garden here but it's very windy here so the trees bend and sway in the wind and they have those skirts that you can crawl under and they do all these dramatic things so looking at the way that those behave and, and listening to the way that children found, find the setting quite strange and spooky that that kind of started me off really and um I started to think what would make the setting even more interesting and spooky. And I thought about all the junky. I'd, I'd been around the, the area and walked a lot and seen a lot of old dilapidated farms that have this machinery that's just stuck there and looks like it's growing out. So I thought well, if I bring that here into, if I just ex expand our own garden and bring that here, because I like to be inspired by things that I look at and I take off with them. And I started to think about who might live there and who, what are the reasons for the person letting everything disintegrate around them. And I started thinking what sort of person that would be. And the wild, forbidding, no-go area then started to grow. And then I started then to be able to feed in my main interests, really, which are like weather and biology and electricity and to create all my characters and plots. And then once I had Alfie, who was the key to it all, he's so, well, he was everything I wanted in a character, really. He's just cheeky enough, but he was endearing and brave and smart, but not too smart to avoid trouble. So once he was in there, I started to think about the, um, the transplantation of people because he's, he's come from somewhere else, doesn't really want to be there, maybe. And I thought, well, what... What about when when you transplant things or creatures or people to a different place and then they start rebelling against that? What if um, in that transplantation there was a creature that was just feeling quite constricted and it had a lot of energy to give off? And what if it started discharging all this energy and then that had the effect on the weather? And and so everything grew from there, really. It was a, a very slow process over, over years to get it right. But the original ideas sort of coalesced and came together quite quickly within a couple of months. So, yeah. Fantastic. Um, just building up on what Olivia said, um, I think it's very rare that you, you get authors that um, described throughout the whole book without it getting repetitive or boring and i just found it so like amazing how well you've described things in here like i absolutely thank loved you. it thanks that's really good to hear thanks so did you you said that obviously you're you're a scientist um did you have to do any specific weather related research or is which, which areas did you specialize in you have said but yeah i actually i worked in both health and environmental research so i started in environmental science that was the first job i had um, and that involved things like collecting lots of samples of soils for example digging up soil cores and then analyzing them to see how much carbon there was in how much carbon the, the soils were actually storing and then another project involved sampling sands from a beach where there'd been oil spills and looking at how microbes were degrading it and helping to clean it up. And on the health side of things, I looked at how a particular complementary therapy was uh, reducing people's symptoms by relaxing people, dampening down their stress response system. And in terms of weather, I worked in, um, I worked in a, a place that did a lot of work on climate change, um, but I was in more of a support role then. I wasn't actually doing the in the field science, but I was I was supporting administratively. So, but I did learn a lot from those people and watching how how they did things and reading their papers and uh, editing things for them. 
And so when I came to the weather parts of writing this book, I, I kind of went back to the beginning, started from scratch, just read and read and read about different weather systems and what causes them and, and how little perturbing things can just sort of poke in and, and cause bigger sort of chain reactions, really. So I suppose the chain reaction of, of weather and the chain reaction of people reacting to things that happen was quite a big theme in the book as well. So yeah, lo lots of weather research went into yeah. it. The scientific background did, to answer your question, it did help, helped enormously with that. Well, I bet you didn't realise when you were crawling around on your hands and knees collecting soil. I bet you never never realised that that would be feeding into a book about a lightning catcher. I didn't, no, <laughs> no idea. Um, so do you still work as a scientist while writing books or...? It, have you left uh, yeah, that behind? I work as a science editor now, so um, I help to polish the writing of other scientists when they submit their research for publication. So I'm still keeping my hand in, but I'm doing it all on paper now. And um, it, it's quite an, an editorial process for me now. So, yeah. So that, that could uh, spark off future ideas then for more books then, depending on what other people write. Yes, definitely. Yeah, to keep my hand in. That's the idea. Yeah, that would be fun. Um, what about this? So you're clearly passionate about science, climate change and the environment. Have you ever considered writing a non-fiction book, either for children or or like a detailed one for adults? Um, a long time ago, I did consider it um, and didn't get round to it. And it does occasionally sort of flit into my mind now and then now. But I think the thing is, with fiction, it takes such a long time to learn how to do it properly that I've been on that path now and I'm on it and I'm quite a way down it. So I'm quite happy to stick to it. I think now that I've had all that experience, I'd like to just use that fiction writing experience and continue to hone it, really. So I don't think in the near future, unless I change my mind, I don't think there's going to be a non-fiction just yet. I'm not finished with the fiction yet. <laughs> well, we definitely like some more fiction from you. And non-fiction would be great too, but yeah, we definitely want some more in this vein as well, don't we, Ambreen? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I know uh, obviously that you used to be a scientist and you obviously you still contribute now and you're an author, but um, there's this one. Um, so as a child... Was it your dream to become a scientist or was it an author? Um, it was both, to be honest, really. I mean, as, a, as a very small child, to start with, sort of I'm talking under five, I wanted to be an astronaut and I also wanted to be a, a marine biologist like Jacques Cousteau. And I wanted to be both and I think I thought I could probably do it on alternate years once I'd learned how to do it. <laughs> So that was the dream until I was about eight and I started reading by myself more and I started reading and reading and reading really voraciously and then I, I from then onwards I just wanted to be a writer and that that was the sort of the only game in town in town for me I suppose I was still really really interested in science though and um I knew that it would probably take a while to be able to be a writer because there wasn't anyone around at that time to say to tell you how do you go about being a writer what do you do between now and then and so yeah I, I've done other careers while waiting to learn how to be a writer I suppose and just hoping that it would come along if I honed it and honed it enough so yeah well here you go Claire here, here's your chance um what's your advice if someone's watching this now and they're either going to be an astronaut or a marine biologist or a writer. What's uh, what's your advice to get them started? Right. Well, I think the best thing to do is to just write a lot, write about anything and everything. Read read an awful lot. Never stop reading, and experiment with different types of writing. Um, work out. Look at some of the lines in your favourite books and pick your favourite line maybe and try and work out what's making it work and if you can find something that isn't working to compare that to then you can you can 
kind of compare the two and really sort of almost reverse engineering really isn't it to find out what's working and what it sparks in you and why that line works and also the main thing I would say is to look for stories in small places everyday things and that's something I wish I'd known when I started out it took me absolutely years to realize that I was waiting for a big story to come along I didn't realize that big stories can grow from small things and little things can turn into big things so if you just write about something that's happened to you every day and in your everyday life and change it a bit and one thing I, I always say is write about take something that you know and write about what nearly happened maybe as well as what happened look at what nearly happened write about what didn't happen turn it on its head completely turn it upside down and just swap things around and play about have fun really write a lot that's my advice <laughs> that's fantastic I love that when we ask different writers this, everybody comes up with some different things. And I don't think anyone's said either of those before. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I like the deconstructing the lines. That's definitely one I'd never thought of. Hmm. It took me a long time to, to work that one out too. But yeah. Eventually. I really like the idea of writing things that could have happened or that aren't possibly happening at the moment. Um, yeah. Obviously, uh, you've given us tips on writing, but... Um, as for character development, like where did you get your um, uh, character ideas from? I kind of, often I never know where they come from. They just seem to pop into my head. But with The Lightning Catcher, I do have an idea about where two of the characters came from. Um, one of them was um, Mr. Clem. And that's that sparked from something that actually really happened in real life that sounds quite bizarre. My son, my eldest son was about 12 at the time and we were standing at the bottom of a hill in the village and this very tall person with long flowing white hair and cloaky clothes, sort of flappy, came striding down the hill towards us at such a real pace and they were unusually tall and it just, it was just such an image that I'd never seen before and neither of us had not we were looking at each other and thinking, who's that? We, we don't know this person. Why are they walking so fast? Why are they flapping like that? And they just, we, we actually questioned whether we were seeing an hallucination. It was so strange. He walked past us and up the other side of the hill and never to be seen again. And so that got me thinking about um, just uh, people that look different and people that look unusual for the, compared to everybody else. And, how it must feel to be them. And so then I got the character that would live in this, this dilapidated, strange old house. And then the other one was Alfie. Alfie sort of came about when um, I had a birthday party for my eldest when he was about 11 at the time. And a few people came that I wasn't expecting to come that he'd invited off his own bat. And one of them was this really confident boy who was slightly older than the rest. And he really commanded the birthday tea table he really spoke confidently and he was so funny and he made everybody laugh and he made me laugh and so that sparked an idea about how, what sort of person I would like to be going into this this scary place and doing all these brave things and I thought that character would be nice and I didn't know anything more about him than just the very confident personality so I made up the rest of Alfie's personality. And when you do that, it tends to be that you will have them in your mind for a while and then they'll morph into somebody completely different than the one that you started with, that sparked it. They grow into their own person because your subconscious does that seemingly all by itself. It's fantastic. And um, um, the other characters, sorry, go on. I was going to say, can I just say, I think you unknowingly met a wizard in real life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I did, yeah. Nobody else in the village had seen or knew or anything about it. It was just a complete one-off. There's um, Gandalf Lily, on his mission. Yeah. Lily, Alfie's sister, to this day, I do not know where she came from. And I have to just say that my brain made her up. She was, um, she probably just came when I'd been working on the story for a couple of months and she just, she just popped up and she, my brain must have just had been mulling it all over and the engine of the book was working 
And so, yeah, I, I couldn't say really where any of the other characters came from. The mum, maybe the mum in the story has a few of my characteristics, perhaps. But my vision of her, she doesn't look anything like me at all. And some of the things she says, I wouldn't have said. And some of the things she says, I, I would. And same with Alfie's dad, actually. He, he just sort of grew and I didn't consciously create him. So, so yeah, it's interesting. Um, Claire, are we going to see more from Alfie and his family, is it? Is there going to be a sequel or something else in his series? I don't know yet, actually, because um, Bloomsbury wanted a standalone um, for The Lightning Catch. They just wanted it to be a standalone book. So whether in years to come something else happens, I don't know. But I'm, I'm working on a different book for Bloomsbury. I'm working on my second book for them. And it's, it's completely different, so it's not a follow-on at all. It's, um, it's a book set by the sea this time. So it's a, a British-Nigerian girl called Jinnika. And it's again, it's about a transplantation theme. So she's been sent to live by the sea from London where she really lives, um, but her family has been evicted from their London flat because things have got into a big financial mess. And her parents decide that if she goes to live with her grandparents by the sea, she'll be out of all the, the hurt and the flurry and working all the hours God sends that they've got to do and that they can just live in a camper van that they've been doing up for this ragged old thing and they won't have to pay rent, but she can't really live with them. So... Off she goes, she's packed off to the seaside, feeling quite cross and sulky about it all, until she sees somebody in the sea. And things start to get a bit more intriguing for her because it's somebody who looks like they never ever come out onto dry land. She never sees this boy out of the sea, he's always in it. So the story goes on from there. It sounds like a mermaid story, but or a merman story, but it isn't, it's a bit different to that. So yeah, so that's what's next. So we haven't got Alfie next, at least not yet. Right, well, how long have we got to wait? We can't, you've told us too much now, Claire. We want to read it. <laughs> When's it coming out? It's coming out next year between May and July. It might get to July before it's out. We haven't got a definite publication date yet. So not too long to wait. It will soon go. Yeah. Time will soon pass. <laughs> oh, we'll look forward to that one. Um, you know how you said obviously there's no plans at the moment for um Alfie uh, uh obviously to progress into another book and I do understand that this book is your first children's um book. Um how did it feel going from writing for um adults to deputizing a children's book? Like was it a big difference and how how do you feel about it? Well, to be honest, I started writing my first book when I was a child, I was eight. So that's when the first children's book came along and as I grew older, when I, in my 20s, I returned to writing, I started again with a children's book. So I wrote a, ch a children's book then, and while that was sort of percolating, and while it was going around and being rejected from everywhere, <laughs> which is what happens when you first start, I started writing short stories for adults. So that was when I made the big leap, really, in my 20s, because I'd always written for children. So basically, I've always had a children's book on the go, always. I can't remember when I haven't, actually. So um, then writing for adults, I've always had that kind of project on the go, too. So it was basically running all, this, all these projects and having them finish, starting another one, some for adults, some for children. It was a matter of luck as to which one was picked up first. And it happened to be that the children's book was picked up first. And I think, I think I'm more naturally drawn to writing for children and, and probably that shows in the fact that it was picked up first, but it's, uh, yeah. So do you think any of these other ones might appear? That book you wrote when you were 20 or even the one you wrote when you were eight, could you use some of those ideas and rework them? No, I don't think so. I've got a few <coughs> one when I was eight. There are some ideas in that that could be reworked possibly for a short story, uh, because I write children's short stories as well. Um, the one I wrote in my 20s, the big book, my first big 
children's book as an adult. That was about Vikings, and I think I can honestly say that's best left in the drawer where it is. I don't think I'll be rewriting that. <laughs> but some of the things that I did subsequent to that, um, they're sort of... Nope. Oh, have no. we lost, we've lost Claire again for a second. <laughs> yeah, we have. I'm sure she'll be back in a minute. Um, whilst we're just waiting for Claire, um, Amber, do you want to say where we can find um, more information about Claire? Uh, yeah. Uh, so if you want to find more about Claire, you can visit her website, which uh, is www.clairewersey.com. Um, I'll just put it up. There it is. And her Twitter um, handle is at Claire Wizzy, but the C and the W are capital. Um, it's right here. Just remember to make the C and W capital when you're doing that one. And I'm sure she'd love to hear from you later on when, when she reappears again. Um, she's going to be setting you a challenge. So it'll be really good when she sets the challenge. If you could um, maybe tag us in and tag Claire in. Because she'd love to hear hear the results of your challenge, wouldn't she, Ambreen? Yeah, definitely. Um, and to be honest, uh, I think you, there's a everyone's noticed now that I always take part. <laughs> I know I'm not a child anymore, <laughs> but I take part in all the in all the challenges that are set usually. <laughs> right. Um, I'm going to tell you now about next week. We're going to keep an eye on Claire. We'll be able to spot when she appears. So next week, I've got a little video to play, actually, because we have um, two for the price of one next week. We've got Helen and Thomas Doherty. Um, they're coming to launch their new book, The Screen Thief. Um, so I'm just going to play the little video and then Claire's going to be back with us. She's just appeared. So we'll come back to Claire after I've played this video because Helen and Thomas, it's always better if they can explain themselves what they're doing. So I'll pop them on for a second. Hello, I'm Helen Doherty. And I'm Thomas Doherty. And we are the author and illustrator of the brand new picture book, The Screen Thief. It's all about this little creature called the Snaffle, who arrives in the city one day, hoping to make some new friends to play with. But everybody seems to be glued to a screen. We're really excited to share our new book with you. So why don't you join us for a story time and live drawing session on the 27th of July at 11 o'clock. As part of Library Adventures Live. And don't forget to bring some paper and a pencil. See you then. Fantastic. So that's going to be a really good one. So you can email in questions to Helen and Thomas in advance, if you'd like to, to our email that I'm sure you all know by now, lal at kirklees.gov.uk, or you can contact them during the session. Right. Claire's a peer, doesn't she, Ambreen? Yeah. So we'll pop her back in. Hi. Hiya, Claire. Sorry about that, again. <laughs> it's all right. Um, we've just had a comment come in, actually, Claire. Oh, right. Um, from Faye Barnden. It says, Claire's book is engagingly written. It's so engagingly written that I'll be joining my two young grandsons in wanting to find out more. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Great. I hope you really enjoy it. We'll have to get her to comment when she's read it. She can tag us in on social media and say what she thinks of it and what, what her grandsons think. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Now, can I just ask you, Claire, I wanted to ask you earlier, then we got distracted. Um, <clears throat> you talked about some pretty crazy weather in your book. What's the wildest or weirdest weather that you've ever encountered? Right, well, I've been in some pretty hefty thunderstorms, but the weirdest thing that happened to me weather-wise was something that I'd forgotten about until relatively recently, and it was when I lived in a house that must have had nylon carpets because there was a thunderstorm one day, and I was just walking along in the house, and a little piece of lightning appeared all by itself, and it sort of did what lightning does. It just went... Duh just in the air in front of me. It was really thin and only about that long. And um, it was not threatening. I mean, it was probably dangerous. And it was probably something to do with static but from these carpets in the storm. But the appearance of it was just like a little piece of lightning, just all by itself. And it was there, and then it was there, and then it was over there. 
It was amazing. Huh? I've never heard anyone. I've never been able to find online or anyone to say that that's they've seen that and that happened to them. It was such a cute little thing. And I think, <laughs> I think subconsciously that might have been what what my mind went back to when I was inventing Wizzy, but I'd, I'd forgotten while I was writing. I only remembered it the other day. Yes. Yeah. Really bizarre. Happened a long, long time ago. That's yeah. amazing. I've. I've had electric shocks from the static. If you touch something metal, it when you've been on a static carpet, a carpet, yeah. I had that, but I've never seen it. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's usually a flash, isn't it? When there's static, like under the bed covers, and mm -hmm. you get a flash of static. But for a discreet piece of lightning that looks just like a piece of lightning, just to be there, never, yeah. seen, never since. It was really amazing. I can only think it was because of these carpets. Well, maybe you're the wizard. Maybe you didn't see a wizard. Maybe it's you. <laughs> Me all along. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, um, I think maybe you've been keeping Wizzy as a pet when you were younger. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like it, doesn't it? <laughs> when you were younger, um, did you have a favourite book? What, what was your favourite when you were growing up? I did. I've got it here, actually. I've got some of my favourite books here. And my absolute favourite, I think, which side? Oh, uh, yeah. Moomin Valley in November by Tuva Janssen. Um, I think that's a book that a lot of people of a certain age will recognise. Um, so, yeah, that I just find it so atmospheric and really melan melancholy. And there's a story within a story in this book as well, because one of the characters, I think it's that little one, on the front, he's called Toft, and he reads about, he gets a book, he finds a book that's too old for him, that's like a scientific textbook, and he doesn't understand it, but he does in a way, because he reads about the little microscopic protozoan creature, who's the first of its kind, and he, it's all scared and lonely, and this, this is an actual real creature, it's a protozoa, and she put this in the book and it really works because you start to really feel for this little creature that's on an evolutionary path that's so different to, to everything that's gone before. And I think that probably sparked my interest in microbiology, actually. I think I can lay it at the feet of this, this book Wow. to start with. I've got a few more. I don't know whether we've got time. Oh, yeah. Books. Okay, so we've got The Giant Under the Snow by John Gordon. That was one of my favourite. You can see it's really it's battered and it's old. Mm. And had it as a child. Um, and then we've got an Australian author called Patricia Wrightson, who um, she, again, she did her settings in the real world, which made it feel much more real to me. So there would be children just going about their business and then there would be... She took some... Um, creatures from Aboriginal folk history and she wove them into her books in a really realistic way. And I think that influenced me a lot too. So, uh, so yeah, those, those are my favourite childhood books. Fantastic. I'd not heard of those last three. I'd, um, <clears throat> I'm reading the Moomin books with my sons at the minute. Um, oh, good. What do they think? Do they like them? Yeah. Yeah, they're really enjoying them. Oh, that's good. But I must admit, I hadn't got the um, November one, so I shall look that one up. Yeah, that's a really good one. It's really, really good. I recommend that one, definitely. Um, I noticed earlier on when you were reading from an extract from your book that your book cover is a lot different from mine. It is, yeah. This is um, a proof copy. So this is uh, the publisher does a few of these before they do the main one with the main cover that we've got and always the covers are always different and this is just so they can see how everything's looking and so they can be happy with the final print version and so they can just be able to proof it more proofreading and perfecting of it and also they send it out uh, to readers that will read it in advance um, uh, give reviews, give feedback to it. So, and yeah, it's interesting to compare the covers. It, it's similar, but different, isn't it? So yeah. Lots of different colours and backgrounds in the final version. 
<laughs> right, I think we're coming towards the end of the session. Ambreen, have you got any, have you got sort of one more question and then we'll finish with our, with our very silly question that we asked everyone. I can't remember if I, this might be a, I didn't warn you about the silly question, Claire. <laughs> Are there any more that you've got that we need to ask, Ambry, before we go on to the special one? Um, well, we usually ask our uh, um, guests this, about biscuits, so this might sound yeah. like a weird question, but if you were a biscuit, what biscuit would you be? If I were a biscuit? No, oh, I've never thought about being a biscuit. <laughs> it might as well be my favourite biscuit. Uh, my favourite biscuit is a Jaffa cake. So I may as well be a Jaffa cake, haven't I really? <laughs> Good choice. Nice is it a biscuit or a cake though, Claire? Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's a biscuit, really. But maybe officially it's a cake. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's something for people to ponder. Now, um, right, thank you for that question. We like to get different answers. I can't remember if we've had a Jaffa cake before. I'm going to have to... We should, we should have, we have. One. have we had one before yeah i think we have we'll have to try and look up and see who the other jaffa cakes are and see if they all get on <laughs> um claire before we go have you got a challenge that you were going to set for people to take part in yeah okay so this is my challenge try to think of something in the house that wizzy has got into and changed and whatever it is it's never the same again so perhaps it now works better than before since she's been in it, or perhaps it's ruined and that's your choice. But it'll probably be an electrical item, but it might also be something mechanical like a, a wind-up clock or a musical instrument, or it could even be something natural like a houseplant. So what you need to do is write about how you're feeling when you discover this. Are you scared? And are you going to tell anyone? And what might your friends say if you do decide to tell them? And also, what could you do to protect yourself from any lingering danger? Because it might still be dangerous. Okay, so that's my challenge. I love that. So, yeah, please do. Um, well, that's our, that's our website where you can watch any of the sessions again. I got a bit excited and put that one up early. So if you'd like to watch any sessions you've missed, you can do that there on kirkleyslibraries.co.uk forward slash lal. But we really love to hear your stories that you've created from Claire's Challenge. So like I said earlier, please email them to us at lal at kirkleys.gov.uk. Or you can put them on social media, but it'd have to be quite a short one to fit on Twitter, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, thank you, Claire. That has been amazing. Really enjoyed today's session. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been really interesting. Cool. We will we'll hopefully we'll um, we'll be doing these LAL sessions um, once we get back to September. We're not sure how often they're going to be, but we're going to keep going in some some way. So hopefully we'll have you back for your new session, your new book. Or maybe we'll even have you in person, Claire. Yeah. Real life, Claire. That'll be exciting, wouldn't it? Excellent. So, well, thank you very much for um, for coming. And we already know who's coming next week. So all that's left for me to say is thanks again to Claire. Do watch next week with Helen and Thomas Doherty. Um, and goodbye from me. Bye. See ya.